so much happens so quickly in the in the world today it's hard hard to assess the impact of the developments i suppose the on on the minds of everyone all over the world are, are the ecumenical developments ever since pope john's pachaman terrace uh, i guess this morning is archbishop thomas roberts sj the former archbishop of bombay who's now visiting america will ask about his impressions of our country too he's been here several times well Father Roberts, perhaps a question about yourself. I know you'll be visiting the American Friends uh, Service Committee a seminar. That's June 28th to July 5th up in Williams Bay, Wisconsin, with other speakers. The theme, peace, fight against poverty, overpopulation, the Negro, or the human revolution. Father, first, you yourself, sir, how you became interested in this aspect of our life, you man of the cloth. Oh, largely, I think, because um, a number of Catholic laymen in England had formed an association called PEX, and they persevered in drawing out essential Christian principles uh, with no official encouragement, but a good deal of active discouragement from authority. And um, I admired their courage and also the substance of what they said. Um, also, of course, as Archbishop of Bombay, I'd been um, right through the war in the East. They made me military bishop for India and Southeast Asia, and during that time I visited British and American troops all over India, Burma, Ceylon, the whole of Southeast Asia up to China, um, which was a curious position for me to hold. Uh, in addition to my duties as Archbishop of Bombay, because my tendencies had always been pacifist and I'd read a great bit about it. I'd also been a great admirer of Gandhi and corresponded with him a good deal. So um, that's where my interest yes. came. Curiously, uh, the highest appointment I ever received was from the American Navy. How's that? Um, it came about in this way. In 1960, I think it was, I had been giving a retreat at a retreat house in Washington to uh, Eisenhower's Catholic staff, and uh, that included a high official in the American Navy, who, hearing that I was due to go back to England, very kindly offered me uh, a passage in any American ship that I liked to choose, and so the most convenient one happened to be a troop ship bound from New York to Bremerhaven, and they undertook to drop me at Southampton on the way back. And when I arrived on board, I found I was down in the ship's manifest as Archbishop of England. <laughs> now, um, truly that, ecumenical development. Truly ecumenical. <laughs> now, that, that, you see, that combined Catholics, Protestants, Canterbury, Westminster, and everything. Then, curiously enough, um, uh, in uh, the end of that year, in '60, I happened to fly on the same plane as that took um, Archbishop Fisher of Canterbury in to see Pope John. And so uh, I introduced myself as the man who had solved all his problems of unity because I was Archbishop of England. <laughs> um, uh, so there is at least something to be said for the American Navy. <laughs> They preceded Pope John, it seems. <laughs> Since you mentioned Pope John... Yeah, that's today, by the way, I think, is the first anniversary of his death. Well, perhaps then, uh, Father, it might be most appropriate if this whole theme, the impact, the opening of doors, of avenues, role of conscience, I know this is a phrase you use, role of conscience and developments in the Church. Yes, uh, when you asked me what I thought was the most... Um, fundamental and crucial issue for the world, I think it would be true to say that the road of conscience means more than anything else. Because um, at every level it's what matters. Uh, we know today that the human race is conceivably millions of years old. Some scientists think so. At the very lowest estimate, it's hundreds of thousands of years old which makes Christianity a thing of yesterday, literally. And um, 
the Jewish revelation also, of course, for the same reason. Uh, even that is only 4,000 years old, which is a mere nothing in the story of the race. And during all that time, um, we may and perhaps must believe that um, God had a plan of happiness for every single human being that ever lived, that if he wanted them with him in heaven, he also gave them the means. And the means, obviously, is conscience, or else there isn't one. Uh, it is therefore as fundamental as that. Um, a large number of religions having come in now, Catholic religion and various forms of Protestant religion and the Jewish religion and the Muslim religion, all of them have introduced a new element of authority. Uh, for the Muslim, for example, the Quran is an inspired book. Uh, the Bible is the inspired book both for the Catholic and the Protestant and for a long time a very fundamentalist attitude was taken to the inspiration of that book and um, in effect both Catholics and Protestants have given up that sort of fundamentalism which is only a way of saying that, that they found a way to reconcile conscience and authority on that level and it seems to me that the problem of Vatican II is to deal with a certain attitude of fundamentalism that there is in the Church, so that many theologians at present tend to regard, especially recent popes, since papal infallibility was defined, rather in the same way that a hundred years ago uh, Catholics and Protestants tended to regard the Bible. Um, now, towards the end of last session, that is about the end of November in 1963, uh, a proposition... The medical session in Rome. Yes, yes. Uh, a proposition was put before the bishops uh, under the heading of um, the ecumenical movement, um, one of them relating to the Jews and uh, the other relating to the whole question of freedom of conscience. Um, in general, they reiterated the idea that conscience is uh, the supreme norm. For the non-Christian, it is virtually the only norm, and that is, that's still the great majority of people. Um, the people who also claim to have a revelation and to have an authority, whether it's a written one uh, or an oral one, as chiefly as with us in tradition and um, the teaching of popes and councils, but even they fall back upon authority because um, before a man can um, obey the church he must for example conclude uh, that there is a God, and that's the work of reason, again conscience, uh, he must conclude that um, a man came into the world to claim to be God, that he proved that claim and all that is a work of reason. And um, before he accepts the Pope as the mouthpiece of Christ, uh, obviously he's got to work that out too, uh, so that the road of conscience and reason really never ceases. Uh, whereas there has been a tendency in the past, both in regard of the book, the sacred book of the Bible, and also of the Popes, to mix up uh, infallibility with what would be better called inspiration. Uh, inspiration could be given to uh, any of us, and often is. We believe that if a man is honestly seeking God's will, God inspires the father of a family, for example, quite often, and the mother. And there isn't any one of us who hasn't or often had inspirations from God. But those are personal and private things, and in most cases uh, there can be no absolute certainty that uh, we've received the whole of God's message. Uh, but in the case of um, the certainty that the Catholic holds concerning the Church's teaching, uh, you've got to apply certain norms, and um, those norms, I think, are the things that will have to be very carefully studied by Vatican II. Vatican I, I think, rather proclaimed than defined papal infallibility. Vatican I, then, is uh, it proclaimed we speak of the pre-John yes, period. Yes, just about 100 years ago, yes. almost exactly 100 yes. years ago. 
Now, what I think needs to be done now is to um, is to define it more carefully. And the reason why I say that is largely on account of um, an issue like um, the one that affects marriage at the present time. Uh, you see, according to the Catholic view of life, uh, Christ is God, and um, he wants everyone to accept his claims. He couldn't, in fact, be God and ask for less. Uh, the Catholic Church also claims that um, uh, the Pope is God's chief representative, together with the bishops, and that um, when all the conditions for infallibility are satisfied, as, for example, when a general council declares something solemnly and without ambiguity, uh, and if that includes all the bishops of the world uh, with the Pope, who is their chairman, so to speak, a divinely appointed chairman, then he is in effect the mouthpiece of Christ. So that the, to the Catholic, it's as though Christ spoke himself, he that hears you, hears me. And now, in this particular matter, uh, we've now associated it on that claim that we make upon the whole world, a claim that contraception is uh, wrong, absolutely. You see. Uh, if they say why, we say, well, your reason should show that to you quite clearly. Now, the majority of non-Catholics today say, but our reason does not show us anything of the kind. Uh, whole nations uh, consider it a matter of duty to base their policy, as in India, for example. I'm about to suggest on, India where you Yes, on various about. forms of contraception. Uh, the United Nations uh, would, I think, certainly go much further than it has done. They would like to, um, if they didn't fear a rift on this particular issue, uh, which would injure the causes it has at heart. That, then, is the position now, the Church herself very much insists that contraception is condemned by the natural law. It was um, about 35 years ago, when Pius 34 years ago, I think exactly, uh, when Pope Pius XI uh, published a letter, an encyclical letter on marriage, uh, which really turns upon that point, that contraception is forbidden by the natural law, and consequently, Everyone who does it, whether he's Christian or not, no matter what his religion or whether he's got no religion at all, but as long as he's human, then he commits a grave crime against reason. Um, now, if he doesn't commit also a grave crime against conscience, which is imputable to him, uh, that is because he is uh, uh, invincibly ignorant. And if the non-Catholic says, well, how do we know that? Uh, in effect, uh, uh, Rome has to say, well, because I say so. Mm. You see. Uh, that, of course, is a lot to swallow. Yes. And it's complicated by the fact now that um, recent studies have shown that possibly half, and possibly far more than half, of the Catholics in the world are in practice doing exactly the same as their non-Catholic friends. One has heard it stated... Practicing birth control. Yes, one has heard it stated, uh, one, it's difficult of course to get statistics about these things accurately, that in the United States 90% of people um, either do it or at any rate accept it. Um, and um, I know myself of a large number of cases of Catholics who simply dropped all religious practice through it. I also have been told of by priests in charge of large parishes in the north of England that uh, large numbers of people simply ignore that particular law and carry on. That is to say, they simply don't mention it in the confession and they go to communion. Then with Vatican II, with the, with the new development, do you see, Father, a uh, definite change in this respect, as far as the Church itself is concerned? Um, the difficulty, I think, about uh, Vatican II actually doing anything about it explicitly 
is that um, to the average person, especially untrained to think about infallibility and what it involves, it looks as though the Church had virtually given up her claim to infallibility, see? supposing any change were made. And consequently, any change made or any modification or any, as they would probably put it, restatement you see, of uh, an issue that didn't sacrifice any essential principle uh, would have to take account of that um, fear of uh, the Catholic and the shock it would be to him. Priests also are liable to be very shocked because they've all been educated to insist upon this in the confessional. Uh, most of them would consider it a duty to uh, refuse absolution to uh, people who admitted this. and They would say, well, I can't absolve you unless you promise not to do it again. Um, and in fact, uh, the situation is extremely confused at present. Uh, and priests are so much confused about it themselves that the Catholics have the impression of um, getting uh, very confused direction and even contradictory direction. And yet you, uh, Father, uh, obviously your time in India and elsewhere, you know, you recognize one of the key dilemmas of our day, overpopulation. Uh, yes, in India... Uh, is probably the country where the issue is clearest, and so I, I like to use India as the field of discussion. I, I'll tell you a story now to illustrate the sort of thing I mean. I had in my diocese, a long way north of Bombay, a place called Surat, and Surat was at one time the most important centre of the East India Company. That was when um, the East India Company, a British company, had gone out there, but before the British formally uh, took over the country and gave it some unity. And uh, I spent a good long time in a cemetery where people had been buried, who belonged to the East India Company, whether on the trade side or the administrative side or the military side, because the East India Company was quasi-government department. And I remember seeing this tombstone, and it was a fairly typical one. Uh, here lie the remains of um, Edward Snooks, whatever his name was, mm -hmm. um, died in 17-something, aged 31. Uh, also his beloved wife, Elizabeth Snooks, aged uh, 29, and then follows a whole litany of their children, mm -hmm. uh, most of them infants, and um, right through, so that uh, I've seen, I think, eight or nine children, quite often, uh, buried with their parents. Now, that means, in effect, that people at that time who had ten children could quite often in India expect to lose eight of them. Now, the problem of the world is summed up in that tombstone in a certain sense. In India it would be, uh, but you don't find tombstones because the Hindus cremate, uh, cremate their dead and the ashes are scattered on a sacred river or any piece of water, so that there isn't that sort of record. But whatever you have records, as with Christians and Mohammedans, uh, you would find uh, that people died young and that very large numbers of children, especially in the tropics, where very little was known about um, the care of babies, child hygiene, and so on. And that is uh, one of the problems which doctors and nurses have created by their skill and devotion. That's a Christian paradox. Mm. Yes. Uh, and it's very largely a triumph for Christianity. Uh, Protestant uh, doctors and nurses, for example, missionaries, have done the most superb work, simply beyond all praise, uh, all over India, and indeed all over East. Uh, but they did, in fact, create a problem, mm. because they, they, uh, it meant that uh, many parents could expect to have eight children and keep them all, uh, whereas before they'd have lost six of them. See. And multiply that by many millions, yes. and you've got the population problem. Yes. 
As you say this, uh, Father Roberts, I think of the parable of this tombstone, and you mentioned role of conscience. Indeed, this mm. this uh, the child brought into the world who must be cared for as a human yes. being. Yes. Yes. And here well, again, uh, you say something faced. You see it faced by yes. the church. Well, now the Indian government has got another problem there, and it's a religious one, really. Uh, most nations have tied very intimately their sexual life to their religious life, so that for practically all nations, the sexual act has got a very profound religious significance. That is obviously the case among the Jews. Uh, it's obviously the case among Christians. Uh, but it is perhaps more clearly found among the Hindus than among any other people. And here's an example of the, the oneness uh, that unites the man and the woman in India. Uh, the orthodox Hindu girl uh, was married to her husband by her parents at about the age of 12. I'm speaking of before the law. Uh, uh, made that impossible or difficult. Um, neither of them could expect a long life. It would have been not at all infrequent for a girl under 20 to lose her husband. But now, if she was an orthodox Hindu, she was expected to burn herself alive on the funeral pyre that burnt the body of What's that husband. phrasing? What's that term That's for that? That's called name? sati. Sati. It's called sati. Uh, she'd put on her best clothes and her jewels, and she would um, immolate herself alive, and she was praised by everyone. I once said to a British governor uh, of an Indian state when I was having lunch with him alone, I said to him that I thought that the British law, which forbade that, was on the whole a cruel law. And quite naturally, he was very surprised. And I said to him, well, you've lived a long time in India, and you know perfectly well the kind of life that girl would have gone back to with her in-laws. Because this sati is based on the idea that she's so much one with her husband that she must give ceremonial expression uh, to her complete desolation. And... Um, she has neither the right nor the will to live anymore now, certainly not the will, and no heart in the matter. Um, half of the combination's gone, mm -hmm. you see. Uh, she's a widow, uh, she can't remarry, you see. Uh, and um, she has to go back to her in-laws, and uh, all of them will be tempted to make her life literally ahead on earth. Much better, therefore, have a few minutes of sorrow, mm -hmm. yes. see, and go out in a blaze of glory. <laughs> Thus the abolition of sati would involve yes. the abolition of other forms of yes. behavior. Uh, in other words, it wasn't a question, really, of abolishing a few minutes of pain for mm -hmm. one girl, you see. It was a question of really changing a philosophy yes. of life. Yes. And now that is the problem that the Indian government is up against. See. Because when they ask, when they ask uh, a, a Hindu... Uh, living in a mud hut with um, his wife and um, perhaps seven children, you see. And uh, he invites, uh, the government says, these children of yours are living on the borderline of starvation, and uh, surely you can see that you ought to limit your family. But in the abstract, uh, even the crudest peasant can see that. Uh, he can see that it's uh, maybe a very bad thing for him to uh, expose his wife to another pregnancy, which the doctor may see as almost certainly fatal. I think the consequences of that to the seven children. Mm -hmm. You know, Father, as you're saying this, I'm, I'm fascinated with something. There's a double threat here. There's a double challenge faced, one, uh, by the church, your church, and two, by Orthodox Hinduism. Rather interesting in this 20th yes. century, yes. is it not? Is it well, now, you've mentioned about Orthodox Hinduism there. Um, naturally, I have many friends still in India, and I've met some of them in America. And they all tell me that um, that uh, the uh, most of the Hindu peasants, and India's continent of peasants, um, 
don't see anything opposed fundamentally to religion or to culture, you see, provided that they can have the sexual act as an expression of love. You see. Uh, they do see that um, uh, because they love the wife, they don't want to lose her. You see. If, therefore, the uh, India's doctors, the Indian government doctors, can say, we can tell you a way in which, now that you've satisfied your desire and your obligation to have a large family, you see, and you've reached the stage where they're all in danger of death by starvation, you see, and you can't afford to risk the life of your wife, you see, or to have another mouth to feed, you see, we can show you a way in which the other end yes. of married life can still be attained. It's marvelous rational what's more than rationalization, good enough reason. See? Yeah. Well now that is that is the fundamental yes. position, you see, yes. of the Indian government. Yes. You see. And um, the Protestants who've gone out there, the Protest American Protestants, for example, who provide a good deal of the money for Indian social schemes, they see it as eminently reasonable, you see. Uh, the Catholic is just about the only one today who says this is a crime against nature. You see, um, strictly speaking, we can't prove it. Hmm. And thus, you, Archbishop Roberts, S.J., you see many things happening, changes, uh, meeting, shall we say, meeting of of dilemma, of dilemmas, challenges by by the Church, uh, with certainly with John's. Uh, yes, uh, I think that is one. Um, and um, the Indian government's solution would be sterilization. Yes. Uh, why? Because uh, this man has got to sleep with his wife uh, every night. They're, they've got nothing to talk about. Uh, they're both of them completely illiterate. Uh, they've simply got one another and their children, and uh, beyond that, there's nothing that matters very much. Um, if he does have uh, um, intercourse in the ordinary way, then he will expose his wife to all the dangers against which the doctors have warned him very solemnly. That is, the death of his wife, and at least the death of their married life, because if he denies his wife, well, then simply the bottom's fallen out of her life. And They're not two but yes. one. Thus you see, of course, the problem as a whole one, the fight against literacy. Yes. A uh, fight yes. against illiteracy. Yes. The, the, the Indian the government's thing. difficulties, actually, yes. in the matter are uh, the lack of literacy, the lack of communications. There is no radio like the one that you're listening to, or hardly any. They've only just started. Uh, there are not enough doctors. There are not enough nurses. And if you take the whole continent of India, it is a continent more than a country, there are something like 800 languages and dialects spoken, which in itself is obviously a very serious uh, obstacle to effective communication and to carrying out policy. That is the problem of the Indian government. Father, you, you see, of course, in India, again, uh, I use the phrase par parables, you see your experience in India as being uh, reflecting perhaps in... in uh, in bold relief, that of the entire world, the overpopulation, yes, peace, yes, east, west, yes, that's and true. again the church and role that's of conscience. That's uh, true. The same problem is found in pretty well every other country. But I think India is the one which highlights it, yes. so to speak. Yes. It's concentrated there, and uh, it's obviously easier to follow there, precisely because the Indian government has um, tackled the problem seriously. If we perhaps return to this matter of role of conscience and the church, yes. Another aspect of it, uh, birth control for one, peace, of course. Uh, yes. I know this uh, involved. You are an involved man in this very much indeed. Yes. You will be at the at the uh, American Friends Conference, April, yes. June 28th, oh, yes. July 5th. Yes. You and uh, uh, James Bevel. Oh, on that subject, since we speak of James Bevel, who's involved with the civil rights program, you met uh, Father Merton. Thomas Merton I at did. Gethsemane, yes, a quite remarkable last monk. Week in Kentucky, yes. And he wrote this, uh, perhaps the most powerful paper I've seen yet, on the black revolution and the white man's conscience. Yes. And yes, unfortunately, I haven't seen that particular one. Um, but Merton, no doubt, you and he had a good deal to talk about. We had a lot to speak about, yes. Um, and he gave me permission to 
to use his um, written matter, his written published matter. Uh, that is, wherever it depends upon him. Um, and I shall probably be doing that on, on this issue of peace, because we've now reached a stage where um, the conscience of at least some Christians is so, uh, so much at issue with um, official government policy, uh, both in communist Russia and in the West, that um, priests hardly dare to be quoted anymore, which is, of course, in itself a, a, a disastrous state of things and state of things of which we ought to be thoroughly ashamed. Well, hasn't a door been opened now, uh, thanks to a large extent to uh, Pope John and his allies uh, and colleagues within the... It's true that a door has been opened, hierarchy. I think, largely by the encyclical of uh, um, Pope John, but even now... Theologians in England and America are falling over backwards to um, um, quote Pope John in justification even of nuclear war, mm. or at least preparing for nuclear war. Really? You, yes. you, you see this. How do yes. you uh, meet this challenge, you, Father Roberts? Um, well, my own personal challenge is simply, my own personal challenge is that um, if I could contract out of nuclear war altogether, I would. Um, and that is um, that's a problem for example of the Society of Friends um, their chief concern I suppose is to avoid paying out money which is going to be used for a purpose which to them is immoral but uh, there there's the difficulty about the way the taxes are collected in the modern state mm. which makes it very difficult amusingly uh, there was a case in London I think in the borough of Hampstead, I read about this last time I was in America, it happened in London. Um, one man who thought that uh, civil defence, um, at least as a protection against nuclear warfare, was nonsense, uh, and also uh, very undesirable because it had bad effects in Russia. Um, and on children too. Yes, on children. He decided that... Um, he would not try and um, avoid paying his rates, you see, or as much of the rates as was going to be devoted to civil defence. Uh, but he asked a, an accountant to work out how much of the money he paid in rates to Hampstead mm -hmm. would go in civil defence. Mm -hmm. And it worked out, I think, something like half a dollar, something like that, you see, not much, you see. But there was the question of principle at stake. So he paid the whole of his rates, including the half dollar, and then he sued the corporation in the courts for collecting money under false pretenses. <laughs> <laughs> he went beyond Thoreau here. Thoreau did something similar yes. to his time. And what was amusing was, uh, if the story that I read was true, <laughs> that the, uh, the, the lawyer who defended him was a conservative member of parliament. Oh. <laughs> a matter of uh, uh, liberty of conscience, I suppose. Matter liberty of conscience. Come back again to conscience. You, I know, uh, Father, I was author of the book, the... The arms race in Vatican II, missiles and morals, and your position. And missiles, yes, but I, I wasn't the author of it. No. It was written by no. several people. No. I, you contributed to it. I contributed to it, and I've contributed to other books. Well, your too. position is quite a, a definite one on this matter, isn't it? Your yes, it's position. small at present. Uh, the opposition is small, but it's growing. And um, the best book, I think, that's been published in England to date was published by six Catholic university professors, all laymen, and the only clerical contribution was my preface. Uh, but the whole orchestra was um, a Catholic lay one. Um, one priest also had subscribed, uh, a Dominican theologian in England, and he was advised to withdraw his, his contribution, uh, which he did, and it was then published in uh, a, a magazine, uh, which gave it even more publicity. Mm. And... Um, then it was very difficult to find a publisher, and uh, it, it, in fact it proved to be a resounding success, and it's been published in America since. Well, you are, um, I may describe you, I think, as a militant pacifist, if I may. If that be accurate description? Of um, yes, except the, uh, if, uh, if anybody you wants to use the word pacifist about me, I would, I would want naturally to define it. Please. Uh, the word pacifist comes from two Latin words, making peace. 
And our Lord said, blessed are the peacemakers, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In that sense, I certainly want to be a pacifist. You see. Um, but uh, I'm not the kind of pacifist who uh, rules out the role of violence completely, because I think that is unrealistic and impossible. And if you ask me for an example, I would point to what the United Nations are doing at this very moment, say either in Cyprus or in a place very near it, uh, Palestine. In Cyprus you have um, Englishmen who went out, about 3,000 of them I think recently, as British soldiers, but at the request of the Cyprus authorities to keep the peace. And then the British government decided this was much too hot for one nation to handle, so they insisted upon the United Nations taking over. Uh, those English uh, soldiers changed their uniforms, and uh, they're now serving most of them under the United Nations, and they are there as armed policemen uh, to keep um, uh, Turks and Cypriots from cutting one another's throats. They've been joined by Irishmen, also sent out straight from Ireland and wearing the same uniform, and that's a tremendous achievement <laughs> for the United Nations already. You have <laughs> Irish and English armies there um, amiably helping one another. That's a terrific <laughs> achievement. And then you have uh, Canadians and Australians and Finns and Swedes, and um, that is an exceedingly encouraging development. Now, all of them are armed, and all of them know how to use arms. And as long as there are silly people in the world and foolish people and madmen and gangsters, uh, we shall never be able to do without police at the international level any more than we can in Chicago yes. or anywhere else. Well, of course, you're talking about international police force, one thing, and the other element of violence of nation toward nation. Yes, uh, well, uh, the, uh, something the, called war. Yes, what, of course, is, is, so, is so absurd about the, the war is that in this particular case of war, um, each nation is judge and executioner in its own cause, a principle which seems opposed to the essentials of justice. And um, so it is the chief point, really, of the encyclical of Pope John uh, that all Christians should, and indeed all human beings, should um, throw themselves heart and soul into the ideals of the United Nations into things like the Declaration of Human Rights. And um, as far as they need correcting, as obviously they will, then they should give the same kind of uh, frank and informed constructive criticism as um, anybody in a democracy gives to his own national government. Well, Father Rappers, do you sense within the church then a trend on... Uh, do you find that you are having more allies? You spoke of some justifying... Pope John's encyclical justifying nuclear war in some convoluted way. Do you find uh, your, if I may, the position that you have becoming more and more strengthened within the church? It's growing, but slowly. Uh, I would say that, uh, certainly I would say without hesitation, that I found uh, more intelligent appreciation of Pope John's encyclical among Protestants than among Catholics. And that's a, a paradox. But uh, a paradox, I think, that the Pope would have welcomed. I think. Yes, the question of paradox in life itself. Other aspects, mm. perhaps, of ecumenical development. You spoke of the Declaration Concerning the Jews. This yes. is rather interesting, isn't it? Would you mind expanding yes. on this a bit, Father Abbott? Uh, yes. Um, the proposition put before us, before we um, left one another, at the end of last session, that was early in December of 63, uh, it was never actually discussed in detail. We got the proposition and uh, it was, so to speak, talked out. But it is certain that it would come up again. Uh, in general, it is prompted by um, the desire not to ascribe to the Jews as a nation uh, the crime of deicide, as we see it, you see, in the death of Christ, in the way that it used to be done. And I think the first thing to notice is that um, it distinctly was done at one time. And uh, the difficulty between Christians and Jews in most countries, and possibly in Germany, 
uh, was really very much due uh, to that kind of um, false teaching. Uh, it was summed up in the liturgy. Uh, on Good Friday, during most of my life as a priest, if I used the words put into my mouth by the church, I'd have had to pray for the Jews called perfidious. At least that's the English translation of the Latin word, perfidy, perfidious you days, you see. Now, uh, one of the things that Pope John did was to change that. He changed the liturgy in several respects in that matter, and especially where justice and charity uh, required it. You see. And um, you may say that this proposition before the Council is the development of um, that attitude. Perhaps another question, aspect. Here in Chicago, we feel strongly the hand of censorship among many booksellers, and often the, the hush phrase is, here in our city, the church. Mm. Now, the question, perhaps, of censorship, is this to the index itself, yes. Father? Is this coming in for a further discussion and perhaps a reevaluation too? Um, well, there's a body called the Holy Office, which is responsible for that, and the Holy Office, in 1908, took that name, Holy Office, in place of the Inquisition, but it is the successor of the Inquisition. Um, it's been found in practice that uh, in the modern world uh, the old methods didn't really get anywhere. Um, and um, as you probably know, Cardinal Frings, Archbishop of Cologne, said in public at uh, one of the um, general sessions, that the methods of the Holy Office, even today, are a scandal to Catholics and non-Catholics alike. You see. Um, I personally agree with that entirely, and uh, I could, if necessary, give my chapter and verse you see, for what I mean by it. You see. But at any rate, that has been said publicly, and so there's no harm in saying it again. Uh, but what they what they do very largely is they um, they substitute secrecy, or rather they they increase the old role of secrecy. And um, that is, to most people, repugnant. And on every level, I think it's a mistake. But above all, to me, it's, um, uh, it's a mistake on the Christian level. Do you feel that uh, there is a, perhaps a change here taking place? Uh, there are changes suggested, changes desired by many people, and changes passionately opposed by the conservatives. Uh, who see um, all sorts of Catholic principles at stake in very much the same way that they did when um, uh, Galileo and some of his friends said that um, uh, the sun was not really standing still, you see, as Scripture says it did. You see. The earth does move. The earth does move, you see. That's, um, I don't really think that that attitude has changed very much in many ways, in certain certain circles. So there is at this moment quite a debate, uh, shall we say, oh, taking yes, place. Oh yes, yes, and uh, that's no, it's no, there's no secret about that because um, uh, all these debates have not merely been heard by observers from all the various religions of the world, uh, but now uh, the principles have been fought for, it had to be fought for, and the principle has been won that what a bishop says on those occasions can be public, you see. I myself haven't spoken at the Vatican Council. What I did was, on any occasion where I had anything to say, um, I wrote it out and handed it into the secretary, you see, which made me entitled to say it, you see. I wasn't bound to use my rights. In fact, I didn't, uh, which saved a lot of time, and I gave press conferences, and it went out in 12 languages. Well, Father, this may be perhaps too delicate a question to ask you, but are you, uh, have you encountered... Uh, how shall I put it, personal opposition or an attempt to uh, perhaps make you be more discreet according to their lights or silence you? Oh, yes. I think everybody must expect that. Um, who speaks um, speaks frankly in a time of crisis, I think. Yes. Father well, Roberts, it's amazing how quickly it seems the hour has gone as you, mm. in your pungent and incisive way, and Christian way, indeed, it seems to me, have, have enumerated some of the dilemmas facing us. Question of overpopulation. You spoke of developments there involving birth control, attitude toward it, peace, censorship. What other aspects, since you look at the whole, the whole man, literacy, the battle against poverty, 
And these, no doubt, will be some of the themes of the... They are the themes of the discussion. Let me just uh, mention this to people. It's a vacation for children, too. Conference Point Camp at Williams Bay, Wisconsin, um, under the auspices of the Quakers, the American Friends Service Committee, and you will be one of the leaders of the seminar there as Jim Bevel of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference um, and uh, Harry Golden and Diane Nash Bevel. And I noticed, too, uh, Stuart Meacham, Emil Maisie, and uh, quite a few distinguished scholars and involved, all involved. This question of involvement, I suppose, commitment. It's a question yes. that your colleague, your friend, Dr. Howard Schomer, I know, yes. uses a great I deal. think the best thing uh, that Pope John did really was the Vatican Coffee Bar because that not only brought all the bishops of the world together where they could talk intimately, you see, and that meant 2,500 bishops of about 140 nations, something like that. But even more uh, valuable was the contact between the um, the um, Catholic and the separated brother. Yes. And uh, that, of course, was having been started at the coffee bar, was reproduced in um, 100 uh, rooms and hotels mm. and all over Rome, you see. Coffee bar is a good phrase, I think. Yes, well, it was literally a coffee bar, you see. It was, uh, it was actually in St. Peter's, in the very fabric, you see. It seems like something na time. natural that a man such as Pope John would uh, think of something yes. like that, wouldn't he, a yes. coffee bar? Yes, <laughs> and we called it, you see, the Bar Jonah, you see, the one of them. Um, we called it the Bar Jonah, those are Hebrew words, son of John, you see. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. And so uh, it was the obvious name for now, it. Now, may I ask, was it just bar coffee Jonah. that was, uh, was just coffee that was, uh, or were there uh, libations perhaps that might be somewhat more spirited in nature? Uh, there was no, there were, it was all very spiritual, but not spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps one last comment. Uh, Father Roberts, our guest this morning, Father Thomas Roberts, former Archbishop of Bombay. You're, you've visited America several times, and the last time was some four years ago. Yes. Have you sensed a change in the temper of Americans, you as an observer? Uh, oh, yes. Um, when I was invited by the Fellowship of Reconciliation to come here, uh, partly to uh, drive home, if possible, the um, implications of the parsimentaries. Uh, I'd read about uh, the American attitudes to peace, and so I thought of bringing a beetle wig <laughs> and talking with my Liverpool accent. <laughs> uh, but in fact, it hasn't proved John necessary. John Lennon Roberts. <laughs> but in fact, it hasn't proved necessary. <laughs> um, and um, I found people uh, much more open-minded than I expected. You, you find, uh, to the theme of peace, you find an attitude, perhaps, that you were saying? Yes, of course, that one knows that there are all the problems of um, uh, the American economy having been so much now bound up with the um, arms industry, and uh, a thing like that's not going to be solved in a day, obviously. Yeah, there are many points that you're making now. I'm sure you will be making there. This very last uh, yeah. point you just uh, slipped out very easily. I'm sure this is the subject of so much discussion, the arms industry yes. and their economy. The question how viable will be in peace, the problem, the yes. challenge to be faced. Yes. That's June 28th to July 5th. Uh, it's called the Two Americas and Two Worlds, oh, yes. involving Latin America yes. and uh, North America. It's at Williams Bay. I understand it's open to the public. and People oh, yes. can uh, find out more information by inquiring of American Friends Service Committee here in Chicago. Yes. It's HA72533. Well, Father Roberts, anything else you'd care to say that we haven't talked about that's on your mind? Um, I don't think there is. Those are the chief uh, things, except to ask people to pray that um, since we've all got a conscience and um, we're all going to be judged by it, all equally, without any difference at all what religions we are, that um, the Council would contribute to carrying out God's plans when he gave us that conscience. You see. So that uh, as far as there's a problem or a conflict between conscience and authority, um, we shall find some solution for it as far as it can be found in this world. Thank you very much indeed. Archbishop Thomas Roberts, SJ, former Archbishop of Bombay, and now obviously always the man involved. <laughs>